The visitors who come here for the Opera Festival are successors to a long line of much less welcome visitors who paid their respects to the place in a whole variety of ways in the more distant past. And they certainly didn't come here for the music. The town owes its name to the Vikings who came in the 9th century, plundered the local monastery and established a local base for more widespread plunder by land and sea. The Normans were the next wave of visitors and their imprint is still to be found in town and countryside. Their visit was the beginning of the Irish question and since then Ireland's turbulent history. Wexford owes its past importance to the sea and one of its most distinguished sons was John Barry, the father of the American Navy. It was here in this marketplace that Oliver Cromwell's soldiers are said to have massacred 300 Wexford women whilst they prayed for mercy in 1649. And just over there is a memorial to the defiant local leaders of the rebellion in 1798. Today, Wexford is a modern mixed town where yesterday's visitors have become today's townspeople. Yesterday's aliens and strangers are today's neighbours. So let's join them now in the Church of the Immaculate Conception as they sing their opening song of praise, All Creatures of Our God and King. is managing director of Wexford's internationally famous Festival Opera. It's an extraordinary event uh, founded in 1951 by a medical doctor here, Dr Tom Walsh, uh, who in response to a comment by Sir Compton Mackenzie that the Gramophone Society should present opera rather than just listen to opera, uh, took upon himself the task of founding this festival, initially uh, as a one uh, opera a year adventure, it has been extended through the 50s and 60s into two and now into three operas per year. And it's an extraordinary achievement today to have an opera of this size and stature in a community this small. And it's truly a community exercise as well for the people here. Yes, and I think that is essential to it. I think their involvement has been critical to both its survival and its success. Uh, fortunately, it has been possible to combine that with professional expertise and to actually marry the two into a very successful event as well as an effect on the community. What has it done to the music of this part of Ireland? Well, it's actually uh, created an extraordinary interest in music in this particular area. Uh, evidence of 
that in the various choirs who operate here, in the School for Music which operates here, and in the fact that young people are now given an opportunity to learn more about music, to experience more uh, of music than they would possibly have in other uh, centres in Ireland. historian in Wexford. The site uh, we're standing on now is the most sacred and ancient in Wexford town. It's undoubtedly uh, in, from remote prehistory, it's certainly pre-Christian uh, and it became the most important Christian site around which the town of Wexford developed. I am captivated by uh, Selskir Abbey and this particular region because of its long uh, service to humanity uh, the continuity in, uh, worship, in divine worship, uh, going back to re remote prehistory, this is, this is what grabs me, that people have been coming here where we are now for literally thousands of years. Is that a religious feeling or, or cultural or national? It's uh, culture and religion and nationalism, I suppose there's a fusion. Uh, there has got to be, and um, as a historian, uh, I would think that they're welded together so thoroughly that I find it very hard at times to disentangle them, you know, but obviously uh, being a, a, let's, a, a, a poor Christian, a badly behaved Christian, uh, I enjoy the comfort and the stability of constant uh, worship here in this place. And of course with these centuries of tradition, the, the old pagan customs have now become part of the folklore of the area. The most significant one in Wexford is the custom in Kilmore where the funeral crosses at every funeral are put into the grave of a specially designated white thorn tree. Now the white thorn tree, we call it in Ireland, the Skiok tree, is sacred. No housewife will bring its beautiful flower into the house whatsoever if she has intelligence on her side. The funeral stops. Uh, the uh, undertaker places a cross in the tree and the other funeral cross of course is placed over the grave and these are never molested and they are there crumbling into the ground from yesterday for example uh, to uh, centuries ago. In fact the hymn you've chosen that's been around a few years hasn't it? Be thou my vision and uh, recited in the praise of Almighty God for 1200 years which alone makes it special to me.
discover new strengths in themselves. Basically, I suppose the people up here call it the promised land. They have so many promises that the houses are actually going to be renovated. But it's been a long, hard struggle. It really has. And now they have started. They've actually completed one block of six houses where they've put in bathrooms, put in hot water for the people. They've started on a second block of six now. Now, you actually chose to live here. Why? Because it's a fantastic community. The people are marvellous. Um, the area that I was born in is a country area, very close community. And same here with Don Villas. We always left the keys in the door at night time. We're on call if anyone needs us during the night. And there's always transport available for people that, women that may suddenly take bad during the night, that would have to go into hospital. And it's that type of community. Has your work here given you a, a, a different insight on the role of the church? It has because I see the church now as watch. We are the church, which is a parish, uh, not an organisation, it's just a parish working for itself. Tell me about the, the place of the community house that you now have. There was a vacant house here in the Villas and um, the parish, there was a parish representative up here one day and she saw that the house was empty and she approached the corporation and um, the corporation really had the foresight to see that a um, community house up here would meet the needs of the people. It is a very close-knit community. But um, they handed over the house to the people and they also gave a cash benefit towards the doing up of the house and the erection of a play school out of the back for the children. So like, we'll be forever grateful that they have handed over the house. You obviously have a great deal of energy and drive, but what do you get from this involvement? I suppose a sense of well-being, knowing that you're able to work in, muck in with other people, and if you can help them at all, or help them to help themselves, basically, that's the enjoyment take it out. And I feel, I feel really great. They're seeing that something is happening. And from there, they get more confidence to go further, you know, to build themselves up as well. And the hymn you've chosen actually sums up your own personal situation here, doesn't it? It does. Like, here I am, Lord. It's um, a sense that the Lord is calling people to do something. You do have to have a call, because you get so involved in the projects that are going on. And I feel, in a way, that I am answering the call by being involved. complete tradition, my background. The music ties in with our Gaelic language and uh, it's part of me. I'm Irish, the music is Irish and I identify with it.
traditional music. We all sit down and play music together. It doesn't make any difference. No inhibitions. We play music, the sector Irish music, if you like, and then we, we will come along into the church and we will play the sacred music. And uh, it's, the transition is quite easy for them. Our music is very important that we can play music for enjoyment. We can play music in praise for the gifts that we have. And music is a gift. And it's our way of thanking him for the, our gifts. Now, another gift you have is book binding, and that's a hobby of yours, isn't it? Many people play golf. I, I bind old books and old tomes. And, uh, again, I suppose the worship comes in, the, the clergyman who comes in with his bravery in pieces. And, you know, you hand it back to him, restored and renewed for him to continue his praying. And uh, it's, again, a big interest to me. It's a great source of enjoyment as well. And there's something else you've been working on as well, I believe. Yes. I have a little present for you. I thought it would be nice to present you, seeing that you're in Wexford, with the Songs of Praise being with a bound copy with the Wexford crest. Beautiful, thank you very much indeed. That's lovely. Of course, the, the funny thing is that the one hymn that you're going to sing isn't in this because you're part of the special choir. Tell <laughs> us about the hymn. Christ on Shield from the Orea de Mass. Um, in a very easy translation, it's Christ of the Harvest, Christ of the Sea, he gathers everything into his barn and into his net. Church of St. Iberius in the main street. I have a great appreciation of Wexford. Wexford uh, to me is uh, my whole life. I've lived here all my life. I know all the people. I care for the people. There's no difficulty at all in being a minority here in Wexford. We're very e ecumenical uh, people here in Wexford. I'm the uh, vice president of the Wexford Historical Society. We have been taking out tours ever since 1960. I like to share with them the, the uh, history of the, of the town. When you're not doing that, what else are you involved in? Well, I do a tremendous lot of visitation to hospitals. I go to Ely House on a Sunday. I go to Brownswood Medical Hospital on a Tuesday. I go to the county hospital during some day during the week. And I try to imbue into some of these patients who are depressed uh, the will to live. So that's the type of thing I, I do. I try to bring people out of their depressions because I've been in depression myself and I know what it is. I 
had a very, very serious accident in 1951, and it changed my whole life. And I went through the valley of the shadow, as it were. And for <coughs> my wife came to me one day, and she said that my doctor had called her in to say that I had only two years expectancy of life. She began to cry, and, and I said, well, God spoke before before the doctor and by struggling and its sheer determination and perseverance and the willpower to get on I'm sitting here with you talking today. And you sing a bit as well don't you? I'm a co-founder of the Wexford Male Voice Choir. I formed the, the choir with Dr. Haddon in 1941. It's 48 years ago. And the hymn you've chosen is a favourite of Male Voice Choirs. The hymn I chose is uh, Guide Me O Thou Great Jehovah. I chose that hymn because uh, I, from my youth up, or from my childhood days rather, I, have, I had a very good mother who brought me up in the way I should go. And she taught me my prayers. I have been guided by God. I put my hand into the hand of God each day and I ask him to guide me. most of Susan Furlong's life. I teach a group what we call music makers here and uh, that's basically uh, small kids and they come in and they have glockenspiels and drums and triangles and all sorts of percussion instruments and um, basically we get them just to enjoy their first two years in music. Music is my life. <laughs> it's uh, extremely important to me. I entered a convent thinking that it was the right place for me to be uh, because of my love of God. But I found out that wasn't to be. It just didn't suit me. It wasn't the right thing. It didn't go the right path. What part does it play in your spiritual journey at the moment? It plays an extremely big part uh, because um, I, near, I thought I was going to take a choice between music and religious life. But at the moment, uh, I'm delighted to be able to marry the two. Now, when you're not being musical at home, your house, I believe, is an open house. The open house came about uh, through a friend of mine who is a St. John of God's sister. And uh, she has been, she's wanted to uh, be part of a prayer house community um, for about 15 years. And um, I would, I'd be very, you know, I'd be good friends of her, of herself. 
and I really understand what she's trying to do. Um, so the house is there, uh, really the, the, the door is open and people come and they stay with us if they want to chat or um, you know, share their thoughts with us. It's just I think life gets on top of some people and uh, they, need, they need some places to come and think and uh, get away from the hustle and bustle of life really. You know? Now normally in this programme people choose a hymn but you've actually part written one for us. <laughs> yes, although I wrote the music for this about four years ago. Um, it's a favourite psalm of mine, always has been, and um, particular lines uh, will come to me when I'm, particularly when I'm tired and weary, as it says in the psalm, uh, I just have to read the last couple of lines, um, so I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory, and I know my soul will be filled as with a banquet. <laughs> shared prayer and blessing are the local Roman Catholic and Anglican bishops, Dr. Brendan Comiskey and Dr. Noel Willoughby. God our Father, your beauty is ancient yet ever new, and your goodness gives the world its variety and splendor. We, your people, thank you for all the gifts you bestow on us, the gifts of family and friends, a rich cultural and religious heritage, and a land of great beauty. Grant us the grace to praise your name with our voices and our lives. Amen. And go in the peace of Christ. And be God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. Amen.